And uh, I will ask Samet to introduce our next guest, Professor Michael Lawton. Is Mike there, uh, Samet? Yes, yes, he is here. Hello. Yes, I'm here. I'm How are you at all? Oh, yeah, Mike. Good, good morning to you. Late night for me here from Mumbai. So I hope you are fresh and I want to become fresh after your lecture. I'll try and make it fresh for you. <laughs> okay. we've, we've talked so much over the COVID period about uh, many of these topics. So it's hard for me to think that what I'm going to say is fresh, but I'll try. Yeah. No, no, I'm sure we will enjoy and everybody is looking forward to hearing from you, Mike. And uh, I'm not sure if Samay wants to introduce you, but oh. if I have to, uh, Samay, are you going to introduce Mike? Uh, he, uh, I, our uh, dear professor, uh, Michael Luton, uh, is uh, a cornerstone of the vascular neurosurgery all over the world. And uh, I uh, want to convey my uh, be, my gratitude and Ellen's gratitude for his support for second uh, uh, webinar of uh, our series. Professor Luton uh, is a well-known figure for all of uh, us. He is a professor and chairman of the uh, Department of Neurological Surgery, uh, CEO of uh, Bow Neurological Institute, Thank you, uh, dear professor, for uh, always supporting us and teaching us. Thank you. Well, it's my pleasure to be here. Um, tell me, can you see my slide of Evandro there? Yes, yes. Okay. Yes, Mike. Well, um, I, I um, can't really start any talk um, without acknowledging this man. Um, you know, Evandro really wasn't part of my uh, neurosurgical upbringing. I um, was instead uh, reared by this man uh, to your right, Dr. Spetzler. And so, um, you know, I think I um, spent the early part of my career not um, thinking I needed to learn from anybody else uh, until I went to um, Valencia. Ivandro uh, invited me to be a, a co-faculty member on one of his courses. And this was one of those courses in the lab that lasted, I think, four or five days. So I literally spent um, a full week with Evandro, and um, he changed my way of thinking. I thought I had learned everything, and he made me realize that um, people do things differently in this business, and there's a lot to learn from others. And he taught me so many things. Um, I think my um, interest in the cavernous sinus began with him. Um, some of the uh, techniques to do the pretemporal approach, transcavernous, postaclinoid, mobilization of the third nerve, injection of fiber and glue, all of those things. When I, when I do those, I think of Ivandro because he introduced me to that. He um, pushed me in that direction. And um, I think like many of you, um, uh, I was touched by his uh, interest in my learning and um, I'm clearly a better surgeon as a result of it. And so um, I think it's a sad day for us as we uh, mourn his loss. Um, well, um, so on to the talk. Um, the uh, terrional approach is really the, the approach in vascular neurosurgery. I've always felt as uh, Ferris just said, um, it, it's, the, it's the place for the vascular neurosurgeon. We, uh, use this um, Sylvian Fisher as our gateway to so much pathology in the uh, intracranial space and the terrional approach is the way in. So um, I think it's one of those things that every vascular neurosurgeon has to know inside out and backwards. And, um, you know, just um, in waiting to speak, I, I did a little search in my database to find out how many terrional approaches I've done in my career, it's 3,804. And so, um, I mean, if you think about that number, it, it's an incredible number. Um, it just speaks to the fact that we do this almost every day um, that we operate. And um, it, it's at the very core of, uh, of the vascular neurosurgeon's um, routine. 
Um, but you know, if you think about it a little further, it's not it's not the, the approach that uh, translates to success in vascular neurosurgery. It's um, it's the skills, the the tenets, as I like to call them. Uh, it's this list of things here on your left that um, um, we do once we've opened up the cranium to uh, to get the job done. And so I'll just make a few comments about some of these. Um, you know, I'm going to show you mostly aneurysm clipping cases because. Um, I think that was my duty here, um, but um, it, it's a real art form. There's so many ways that you can clip aneurysms. There are so many clips in that tray, and uh, there really is an art form in how you make those selections, make those um, reconstructions, how you work the clips around perforators and branches and um, reshape the flow in the lumen. It really is, um, I think, um, the, the art of aneurysm surgery. Um, other parts that go into mastery um, are, are these. Uh, I'm going to focus on these these uh, six points uh, mainly. And the first is the microscope. The, the microscope um, truly is the uh, extension of um, our eyes. It makes our most important um, sense even stronger and better through magnification and illumination. And um, the technology is so good that it really becomes one with your body, with your movements. And um, this is my setup. Uh, you can see that I sit, you can see that I use the mouthpiece. Um, and uh, I think um, the combination of um, those ergonomics and uh, the power of the scope um, is what uh, really makes us better uh, because the more we see, uh, the better we see, uh, the better we perform. Um, second on the list is dexterity. Um, we, we probably don't talk about this enough um, because we kind of um, assume that people understand this, but um, how you hold an instrument with your thumb and index finger is obvious, but more importantly, how you stabilize it with your other fingers and how you stabilize your hand uh, is really what gives you that steadiness, that assuredness um, to, uh, to really do the job. Um, Dexterity requires practice. You need to get comfortable with the moves, the instruments, the, uh, the uh, goals in, uh, in the maneuver itself. And um, with time, you, you want to just strive for that perfectionism where you can do uh, things as perfectly as humanly possible and as quickly as humanly possible. Uh, next on the list is anatomy. Um, it's a beautiful landscape that we walk through every day. And um, uh, I think um, we're lucky because uh, that beauty is what I think makes us all study it so much and uh, figure out um, these little avenues, these little spaces, as Ferris referred to, these um, little uh, anatomical gems that we see over and over. I think um, you know we're lucky that uh, we, we have such a uh, alluring uh, place for us to do our work in. And, and the more we study it, the better we get. Uh, case volume is really, I think, the secret. Um, I've been blessed to be able to focus on vascular. Um, I think um, that's not always um, something that everybody can do because of the needs of the day. But um, in, in the two systems that I've worked in primarily in San Francisco and in Phoenix now, I've been able to focus, which has translated to um, big numbers. And I think with big numbers comes um, uh, better outcomes and uh, that expertise that we all want. Um, so anything you can do to create that in your own practice is, um, is critical. Um, the pen is mightier than the scalpel. And what I mean by that is that um, we're only as good as the time we take to reflect. Uh, we have to reflect on what we do. We have to look at our results. We have to try and communicate those results so that even we understand them better. And um, you know that's certainly what I've tried to do with these books. Um, but it's not necessarily the books. It's the um, that reflective uh, time and effort uh, to think about what you're doing and whether it's working. Um, and then finally, um, pushing boundaries. You know, um, Evandro and and Spetzler and uh, Michael Jordan. I mean, I think we see it around us where, when these uh, talents come through. Uh, and we see how they pushed boundaries in their day. Um, if, if we do the same in ours, uh, I think that's how we uh, uh, grow the field, uh, get better individually, and move the, the field collectively forward. 
And so um, I, I think that's a really important part of, uh, of, um, of this talk. So uh, with that, I'm going to go basically to cases the rest of the way, because um, I think um, cases are so instructive and uh, um, um, they, they show you what the terrional approach can do. Um, this is a giant or near giant ACOM, um, a tough one to clip for reasons which I'll show you in a second. But um, the clipping technique here um, was a reverse picket fence. And again, that art of clipology, you know, using your clips and finding ways to reconstruct hemodynamics, this is what the clips are all about. And in this case, uh, you can see that um, given the trajectory of the views and the anatomy that I faced with, um, uh, I used this reverse picket fence. And so here um, uh, is that video. Um, there we go. So here we're looking at, um, across the uh, optic chiasm and um, this was a case that was explored by another neurosurgeon. Um, he found that the um, planes between the A2s just weren't opening up for him, and he couldn't uh, he couldn't get the uh, the clips on. So he stopped and he referred it. And as as you look over this anatomy here, what we're seeing is the A1, uh, the A2 here is on the contralateral side, and this is that plane that you can see. The, the true neck is somewhere down in here, but this entire um, a2 on that opposite side is adherent. So um, you can't always open up these planes. You can to some degree over here, but as we go across to the other side, uh, you'll see that um, they just don't open up. And uh, you have two choices at that point. You can either um, really force the issue and try and drive down this line and risk getting into the aneurysm, or you could use this um, reverse picket fence. So here, this first fenestrated clip goes right down the center of the aneurysm. And you can see I've placed a temporary clip. I use that first clip as a fence post and I build the picket fence to either side, uh, working from inside to outside. And so with each clip, you can see the heel of the fenestration is closing uh, on the neck. It's transmitting the perforators and the recurrent arteries on both sides. You can see them below the clips. And with each heel uh, pressure point, I'm closing a bit more of the neck, and the blade is actually compressing the uh, the dome. So um, that just continues until you reach the end of the aneurysm. And uh, so as we get to the left-sided end here, we uh, take care of that side. You can see um, a little bit of a dog ear here, which takes another clip, but this creates that picket fence uh, where the ACOM now goes through the tunnel of the fenestrations and um, here it is angiographically, uh, good reconstruction there, good reconstruction of the A2s. And I avoided having to try and open up this cleavage plane on that contralateral side. Uh, here's another case. I think um, in this endovascular era um, where uh, it's easy to throw in a stent and throw in some coils, but not so easy sometimes to cure the aneurysm. Uh, we're then faced with the cleanup duty. And uh, here in this case, this is uh, a recurrence um, uh, of an ophthalmic artery aneurysm. This aneurysm was actually operated on um, and uh, uh, an attempted clipping was done. Um, then it was treated endovascularly and you could see the work there. But, but clearly um, when I got in here, this was now probably a decade later, um, it was clear that the clinoid hadn't been drilled. Um, all of this work needed to be done. And you know, I'm not going to um, go through all the details because Ferris did a very nice job showing uh, clinoidectomy and so forth. But um, with that extra skull based dissection, you can now see that even with coils and even with uh, uh, a stent in there, you can um, expose the neck, you can get a fenestrated clip around that, and um, you can shut this thing down. The goal here was optic nerve decompression and visual preservation. She was actually losing vision on her opposite optic nerve. This ipsilateral optic nerve was already uh, damaged by the aneurysm and the treatments. Um, she was blind in that, that eye. Uh, but her contralateral eye um, uh, was, the, uh, was the eye that we were trying to uh, save vision that was progressively being lost here. And so these fenestrated clips um, close the distal neck. You can see 
the tines of the stent here through the wall of the artery. Um, I've used two fenestrated clips and then a closing stack of clips. And now um, uh, you can also see it's something I don't really do much anymore, but I, I did use carotid uh, uh, exposure and control for that. But now um, the real part of this operation is the, um, is the decompression. And uh, you can see um, now this aneurysm is essentially dead. Uh, there's no pulsation in that sac. So we can go in, we can enter the aneurysm and we can aggressively decompress it. So here's a CUSA. You can see the coils within it. We can take that decompression all the way down to the coil mass. And once you've um, removed all that clot, remember the coils only occupy about a third of the volume of an aneurysm. So if you take out the, the thrombus around it, you're gonna get two thirds of that out. And here now we're visualizing the contralateral optic nerve, contralateral carotid artery. And here you can see now the aneurysm is soft. Uh, I can peel it away from the optic nerve. This is the optic nerve here. And this is what actually saved her vision. So um, I decompressed her nerve, I took that pressure off and, um, and her vision, um, it didn't improve, but it no longer progressively worsened. And uh, that was the, uh, the objective. Um, so um, moving on uh, to uh, some basilic bifurcation aneurysm uh, cases. This is uh, how I like to think about the um, dissection steps. You've got to start superficial the PCOM is always there as a, a trail marker. You can follow it back to the PCA. Uh, you can then um, dissect pretemporally and free things from the incisural space. You find the third nerve. You then work medially to the P1, the endosurface, where there aren't any perforators, down to the uh, SCA and the P or the basilar trunk here, and then uh, across the neck. Now, the transcavernous approach. Um, Again, homage to uh, Ivandro. Um, this is something that I started doing after that um, week in Valencia, uh, learning from him. Um, but this uh, really um, expands the windows and uh, gets you further down the trunk, uh, which is very valuable. I'll show you its application in this case. This again is a endovascularly treated case um, after a subarachnoid hemorrhage and a failure. Uh, you can see, um, this aneurysm essentially is posteriorly projecting and it's slowly eaten away his midbrain. It's a 13-year-old uh, kid at the time of the subarachnoid hemorrhage. was treated uh, endovascularly with coils, uh, then treated with stents and more coils. And you can see that over the year and a half, um, this thing just continued to grow. Um, he got better from a subarachnoid hemorrhage, then got worse as this uh, treatment failure progressed and you can, um, see the massive compression uh, on the brainstem. And so uh, for this one, um, this is now um, the uh, transylvian exposure. Uh, I've left out the uh, clinoidectomy, but you can see here now we're coming down to the basilar trunk. You can see the um, stent here that's in the PCA. So it goes from the basilar trunk and out the ipsilateral uh, P1. You're, we're looking here across the, the, uh, the base of the, this is, a, as you know, a, a giant basilar. And look at how this space has been enlarged by anterior clinoidectomy, some posterior clinoidectomy, and a good pretemporal dissection. Uh, so that window is now um, uh, plenty large for me to do my work. And um, you can see these perforators in this uh, area below the SCA. I'm going to go on with the temporary clip. I'm, in, in fact, going to go on with um, three more temporary clips. I'm gonna isolate the aneurysm as best I can here. So clips on the P1 ipsilateral, clips on the SCA ipsilateral. Here, this is a duplicated SCA and clips on the contralateral SCA. So now the aneurysm is um, uh, not fully trapped, but mostly trapped. I've also got um, a uh, cardiac lead in here, so we can use rapid ventricular pacing if this uh, 
opening here turned out to be bloody, but in fact, uh, it was pretty quiet. And again, uh, like on that uh, ophthalmic I just showed you, I, I went in with the CUSA, I took out thrombus down to the coil mass, and now you can see that this giant aneurysm is workable. It's got some pliability. I can um, now dissect these planes behind the aneurysm and find uh, the perforators, clear those away. And here I'm going in with my fenestrated clip. This is, again, um, what we often use for these basilars is this tandem fenestration technique where the fenestration jumps the thick tissue proximally, gets good closing force distally. You can see this is the longest fenestrated clip in the set, and it's still not long enough, so we have to go on with an overstacked fenestrated clip. The clip here is actually partially inside the uh, opening into the aneurysm, but this second clip gets me across the neck and this closing clip beneath the fenestration now closes that uh, opening that I had made in the aneurysm itself. So here now, inspection time, you can see the contralateral SCA, you can see the ipsilateral SCA, you can see here the um, PCA with the stent in it, and um, our blades going right across the neck. So with IC green, we see good flow in the trunk, in the SCA and the PCA. Uh, the wall is thickened here because of the stent, but there's good flow in that. So uh, success, we uh, have closed the aneurysm. Now we can be a little bit more aggressive with our thrombectomy since we're no longer experience, experiencing ischemic time. And this is just checking to make sure that our perforators look good. And again, that widened window that um, Transcavernous approach gives you that wider window between uh, the carotid ocular motor space. It, it essentially takes the carotid ocular motor triangle and blows it up into about twice the size. So here's the before and after shot. Um, you can see um, uh, here's before with uh, the recurrence. Here's after we preserve the PCAs, the SCAs. Um, everything's filling out nicely and. Uh, here he is three weeks after his surgery. Um, you know, I was a little hesitant because um, this was such a formidable case, but this kid told me he wanted to walk again and um, uh, he was committed to going forward. And, uh, and so we did this and uh, there he is. So um, giant aneurysms are like that. Um, these are some numbers. Uh, you can see uh, uh, this is 22, 22 years worth of uh, data review and, uh, you know, I, I think um, um, uh, giant aneurysms are a different beast. They're not uh, always amenable to the kind of clipping I just showed you. Uh, oftentimes uh, you need a bypass um, and a, a different strategy. And so, um, you know, uh, these uh, bypass strategies are uh, really important. Um, so I'm gonna show you um, this, uh, this case, this is a middle communicating artery. Um, and uh, again, um, it uses the, uh, the terional uh, window. So uh, it's relevant to our discussion today. Uh, so here, uh, a very dolichoectatic aneurysm. Uh, you've got three trunks of the trifurcation here coming out in this particular middle communicating artery. I'm going to do a double barrel STA MCA bypass. These are the two limbs. I'm going to put those in first. And the middle communicating artery is now this part, which is going to be animated. It's the bringing together of the trunks of two of these uh, middle cerebral trunks, the M2s together, to create this middle communicating uh, segment here. So the bypass supplies the uh, trunks, but the middle com uh, supplies or redistributes the flow uh, in between them. So uh, that's the animation, and um, this is what it looks like in real life. So here are those two distal trunks coming out of this thing. And uh, as we look proximally, you can see um, the third trunk and the, uh, uh, and the M1. So I'll... Uh, skip through this because this is just STA MCA bypassing. Uh, and once we have the double bypass in there, um, now what we're gonna do is we're gonna transect two of those trunks 
that have received the bypass off of the aneurysm. And you can see the uh, two ends can come together end to end and form this middle communicating artery. So um, if you look carefully, I'm showing this intraluminally. It's an end-to-end -end anastomosis. And the idea here is the STA here is bringing flow inward, as is this one. But this communication allows the flow to redistribute itself. So you can see how outsized these M2 vessels are. And you can see how um, this communication will allow for the redistribution of flow. Uh, just in case one um, isn't doing what it needs to. So here um, is flow in the middle communicating artery. It forms this kind of U loop. And um, it's a really nice way to, um, to deal with these dolichoectatic um, aneurysms. And there's just the icy green uh, showing it. Um, there's the post-op. And you can do this in many ways. Here's, here's another example of a middle com. Uh, in this case, um, giant MCA, dolichoectatic. I clipped, uh, clipped this with a picket fence years ago, five years ago, and uh, got a good result, was pleased with this. You can see the reconstruction here, but when I brought her back for a five-year follow-up, you can see that the aneurysm has regrown. So what do we do in this case? Well, uh, we're gonna do a, a, another MCOM, but this one's a little different. Uh, we're gonna use a, a high flow uh, ECIC bypass here. So the first thing is to put in the high flow bypass. And this is from the external carotid artery. Here's our middle communicating creation here right there, bringing the one trunk over to the other. We can then distally clip occlude the aneurysm. And now the middle com uh, supplies the entire middle cerebral territory. So um, here's what that looks like. Um, in real life, this is the view of that same aneurysm five years later. <clears throat> you can see the um, frontal division here, the temporal division over here. And now uh, going down to the neck, this is going to be our external carotid artery donor site. This is the um, radial artery graft going in. I like to do a double aortic punch here in the external carotid to, um, to bring those vessels together. It creates a nice wide opening there. And then a running uh, 7-0 proline here brings the uh, end to side anastomosis to completion. And um, now um, with that in place, uh, you can see that um, we uh, return to the Sylvian fissure. This here is the temporal division now and uh, we're gonna isolate that temporal division, do our arteriotomy. And this high flow bypass will then take care of this temporal trunk, but we've got the frontal trunk over on the other side. So one bypass, <clears throat> even though that one bypass is high flow, isn't enough, <clears throat> excuse me, it's not enough. So you've gotta um, first do the, uh, um, uh, the high flow connection here, but then uh, we're going to do our middle communicating uh, anastomosis as our second step. So these are the finishing touches here on the, um, the high flow bypass. Here's flow showing good, uh, good patency of the bypass. Now, um, we're going to take this proximal end of that trunk. And here, it would normally just be dead space that's not even used. So there's no ischemia time in taking this artery off of the aneurysm and flipping it over to the other trunk. Flow is already going into the distal territory here. So we're, we're not subjecting that territory to any additional ischemia. We're just using this end now to, to re-implant onto this uh, frontal trunk. And so um, you can see the handiwork here. It's an end to side reimplantation of the temporal trunk onto the frontal trunk. <clears throat> here's the, uh, the deep suture line sewn uh, interluminally. And here's the completed anastomosis. So this is our MCOM right here, this segment here. And now um, 
uh, I'm just showing you here some lenticular strides here in the back, which uh, precluded us from completely trapping this aneurysm. So we're just going to do a distal occlusion. So this isolates the frontal trunk. And now the entire circulation feeds off of the high flow bypass. So um, in the interest of time, I, I know I'm getting a little short here. So I'm going to um, just show you the animation on this. This just shows you uh, another way to do an MCOM. <clears throat> the first example was an ECIC. The second example was a high flow ECIC. And this example here is uh, a similar dolichoectatic aneurysm, but we're going to do this all intracranially. So it's an ICIC variant and our donor site is going to be the A1. The A1 over here can be an excellent donor uh, for um, our, our interposition graph. So we'll use the A1 as the donor, the M2 as the recipient. No need to go down to the neck. Here's our MCOM over here. And uh, I'll just take you all the way to the bitter end here. We put in our bypass. We do an end-to-end -end reanastomosis here of the, uh, the trunks of the M2. And in the end, uh, we have this nice end-to-end -end reanastomosis here with our high flow bypass coming around here to the distal M2. So um, a really nice way, these, these MCOMs to, uh, uh, to reconstruct the anatomy. So this is just our icy green and an overview shot. And here's the angiogram. So we, as we look at the angiogram, here's our graph that jumps the aneurysm. Um, the MCOM portion uh, is um, uh, right in here where the trunks connect and we've got good flow in the territory. Um, all right, I think, um, I'll show you one last case. Um, you know, let's do this one. Uh, so this one here um, is a uh, giant aneurysm that involves the M1 segment. You can see here from the angiogram how um, it originates here right at the early part of the M1. Um, and uh, terminates right at the bifurcation. This is the uh, patient uh, positioning here. And uh, our strategy here is to first do an STMCA bypass, then do a trapping, and then do an M1 to M2 interposition graph. So here is just uh, an overview of the anatomy. Uh, you can see how the terminus of the M1 is right at the outflow of the aneurysm. And so um, just as a, uh, as a safety net, I'm going to first do an STAMCA bypass, which you can see here. And so that, um, that gets some flow in the distal territory. Um, and that provides us with this safety net. And now we harvest the radial artery, we bring it in there. And um, now we work on the, the aneurysm. This is now the carotid terminus. The M1 is here. We put a temporary clip and we march up the M1. You can see a very large lenticular stride trunk. So we have to back up our temporary clip. And um, this is our distal trapping of the aneurysm with our bypass in place. Um, I'm comfortable with, that, with, the, with the ischemia time that I'm gonna spend here. But now you can see um, the aneurysm is soft. It's not completely dead. So I go inside the aneurysm to figure out why it's so alive. And you see there's a small anterior temporal artery that we're looking right down the orifice of the artery right there. So that tells me that that's what's keeping, um, that's what's keeping the uh, aneurysm alive. So we just uh, now go extra aneurysm, find that anterior temporal artery and, and trap that. And now um, we do, uh, an aneurysm resection. So here now I'm cutting the M1 off of the aneurysm. I'm using a little bit of that tissue to create sort of a funnel shape, the stump. 
And you can see that intimal surface is nice and clean. So uh, I'm going to use that. And here comes our radial artery graft. This is now an M1 end-to-end -end anastomosis with our graft. And uh, this is a really nice um, matching between the graft and the M1. So I, I really like this M1 bypass. The, the danger, of course, is um, lenticular stripe ischemia. But you can see from our clips, we've excluded all the proximal lenticular strides. And the aneurysm pushed all the others to the back end. So um, uh, he ended up tolerating this just fine. Uh, it's a running continuous suture line here. And once we get uh, halfway around, we can flip the artery and bring the stitch down the backside. And here, completing our anastomosis, this now takes care of our proximal end. So, so there we have the, um, the proximal end. And now uh, we've not, we have to bring the, uh, the distal end around. And this comes into uh, a distal M2 segment here, just beyond the aneurysm. And let me just jump ahead. Here now the bypass is done. We take off our clips. Aneurysm is completely excluded. And we've got a nice reconstructed M1 segment. So there it is. It's a small jump intracranial graft. It's the terional exposure. Uh, our icy green looks great, and um, uh, you can see uh, uh, complete exclusion of that aneurysm, and uh, this guy did really well. So here's just the overview, showing the anatomy, showing how that terional exposure and that um, and that's uh, Sylvian Fisher dissection uh, gives you this freedom to create this uh, reconstruction. So um, let me finish. Um, I, I like to think of mastery in this business as a combination of hands, head, and heart. Uh, hands is the dexterity part. It's your skills, your touch, uh, how you handle the tissues. Uh, really uh, critical in vascular because of the uh, unforgiving nature of the tissues. Uh, head, now that's referring to us, not the patient. It's being strategic in your game plan being creative in how you execute, having good judgment all the way along the way. Um, that's really what uh, makes these cases go well. And then finally is the heart. Um, these are unforgiving, difficult, trying cases. It takes a lot of grit to get through some of them. Um, there are failures along the way. I call these my ghosts that never leave me. Um, but I think those ghosts are what make us strive for perfection. Um, so um, just to finish with these graphs, um, you know, the, the aneurysm curve for us, uh, I think globally, is, um, has, has bent back towards Earth. Um, we were flying high for a while, uh, and, um, and you can see that um, the trends are fighting against us, and that has um, mainly to do with market forces from the endovascular side. But I think um, for us, um, this whole idea of mastery uh, is really important. We've got to begin our careers uh, where we're curious. We don't really know how we might turn out as surgeons. Uh, we, we persist, we, we develop our skills with discipline and with um, all the things that I talked about at the beginning. Um, with discipline, you keep climbing that mountain and you reach a level of proficiency, which uh, uh, I think is um, what we should all strive for. We, we need to be proficient so that when people depend on us, we perform and we deliver. Um, I think this is where it gets interesting for um, many of the panelists who you, you've heard from this morning. Um, they've demonstrated excellence. They've gone well beyond proficiency and they've pushed that envelope. They've pushed those boundaries. And um, I think when you get into that territory, um, that's when you can really um, start evolving. You can um, ask yourself what's next and um, what will the field look like uh, as we continue on our journey. So I'm going to stop there. Um, thank you for uh, the opportunity to 
speak. There you go. Thank you. Thank you, uh, dear Professor, for uh, outstanding lecture.